Turn in your Bibles, please, to 1 John chapter 5. We've taken a side trip away from our study through 1 Corinthians uh, for a few weeks, the last three weeks, in order to teach some of you, remind some of you, of what the Scripture has to say about redemptive, corrective church discipline in anticipation of taking action at the end of today's service to follow God's directives in the hope of seeing one who's lost her way from us be recovered uh, to the Lord and to this church. Today I want to preach on a standalone topic which really really ties to this, uh, are you an overcomer? Next Sunday, uh, Lord willing, we will, uh, that's Reformation Sunday, we will take a look at our Reformation heritage. Last year, you will remember, was the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. And we will study the scriptures next Sunday on an aspect of the Reformation. The following Sunday, the International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church is uh, a day that we will practice what the Scripture tells us about remembering those who are in chains as if chained with them. And then we'll be getting back into 1 Corinthians, beginning in chapter 14. Are you an overcomer? 1 John chapter 5, verses 1 to 5 is the text we want to look at today. I want to ask you to stand with me. I hope you found that in your Bible. If you don't have a Bible, we've got that on the screen for you so that you can all see. Uh, There's a a method here. We see the Word of God. We hear the Word of God. At times in the service, we actually read together the Word of God. And the point is that the Word of God may dwell in us richly. That's how you become an overcomer, by the way. Appreciate the song selection that Josh made today. It's focused on uh, the fact that we, as Revelation says, we will overcome by the blood of the Lamb, washed in the blood of the Lamb, and by the testimony we have that His blood has been made effectual to us in a saving way. Follow along, if you would, as I read verses 1 to 5. In this closing chapter of this little letter that, by the way, if you, it was accompanied, it accompanied the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John was this great treatise written by, by John, uh, the beloved apostle, and he sent this letter along with it to introduce that to the churches that were receiving his Gospel letter. Everyone who is believing, I'm going to put the force of the tense on the verbs here for you. Everyone who is believing that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who is loving the Father is loving whoever has been born of Him. By this we are knowing that we love the children of God when we are loving God and obeying His commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God is overcoming the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that is overcoming the world? Except the one who is believing that Jesus is the Son of God. What have we read together today? We read the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. May the Lord teach us from this. The distinctives of what my dear friend R.F. Gates, my mentor who's been in heaven now for several years, would make the distinction in what he's called saying faith, I believe, and saving faith, faith that overcomes. Thank you. Please be seated. You see, it is as you approach Christianity from this perspective that you find yourself persevering to the end. That you do not find yourself going off into scandalous sin with no indication that you intend to repent and return. 
Anyone can say, I'm a Christian. Anyone can say, I believe. But it's only those who have truly been saved have genuine saving faith. We have to, we have to use these terms today because, because the idea of saving faith has, has so been neutered. Multitudes follow Joel Osteen and think he is the greatest thing since sliced bread. They, they, they have no discernment, but they would all say, yes, I'm a Christian, and he would, he would assure them of that. And, so I, and I tell you, he is a heretic, and those who follow him will follow him to the pit. I'm not interested in saying faith. I'm not interested in mouthing I'm a Christian. That fills hell up. But I am interested for myself and for you in saving faith, genuine saving faith. And so we're going to see this text today for a few minutes on this idea of overcoming. I think that's, a, that's you know, here, around here you don't hear us talk a whole lot about are you a Christian. We ask, are you a Christ follower? Are you a follower of Jesus Christ? That takes action. There are multitudes sitting at home right now. In this city, who don't give a thought about gathering with the people of God, and yet they imagine when they die, they will go to heaven. Heaven would be hell for such people. This text opens up this way. Overcomers have genuine saving faith that comes from regeneration. Second, overcomers have a love for God and a love for others. Third, overcomers love God and delight in keeping his commandments. Fourth, overcoming is the inevitable outcome of regeneration. Fifth, overcoming is fueled by genuine saving faith. There's almost sort of a, it almost begins in circles, it comes back, right back around in this text. It's fascinating what the apostle is doing here. And so in verse one, everyone who is believing that Jesus is the Christ, has been born of God, and everyone who is loving the Father is loving whoever has been born of Him. This idea that overcomers have genuine saving faith that comes from regeneration. The, the verb flow shows that. There's a, there's a debate, theological debate, and we're not going to get into the theological debate today. Which came first? Faith or Regeneration. Well, it would be like me asking, which came first, the baby's cry or the baby's birth? You'd say, preacher, you're being silly. No, I'm just following the teaching of this passage here. If you are believing that Jesus is the Christ, and I don't mean a notional. I'm not talking about just a head acknowledgement. James says in this letter, the demons believe that. If you are believing that Jesus is the Christ, then you have been born of God. There's a construction here that basically says this. Something has happened upon you. It's not something you did. Has been born. Perfect passive. Something has happened upon you in the past. And what happened upon you in the past has had and continues to have an abiding result in you. You don't get over being I grew up when, uh, when B.J. Thomas, remember B.J. Thomas? Well, some of you may not remember him. He was a folk singer, and, and B.J. Thomas decided back in the, I think it was in the 70s when the whole Jesus movement thing was going on, he decided that he wanted to be born again. He wanted to be a Christian, and so, so he announced that he was. I don't know if his, if his record sales were flagging over in the, in the arena of the non-Christian, but he began to write songs purportedly Christian songs, and of course Christians were thrilled that a celebrity would identify as one of them, and so they were buying up his songs and, and albums and stuff. And then down the road he said, I've, de I've decided I don't want to be born again anymore. Well, you know, you want to say to him, don't worry, BJ, you never were in the first place, buddy. No danger, except for your soul. See, it Having been born again, it's what produced faith. Just as your child, if you've, if you've ever given birth to a child, I, I yield 
to you on that? Have you ever been in close proximity to someone who was giving birth? I've been there. You know good and well. I mean, I remember as a dad, I've told you this several times through the years, I remember as a dad just praying, oh, dear God, I want to hear the cry. The first two births, by the way, they made me stay outside, all right? So I was, one, I was in, I think, a whole other building looking up at a pink and blue light waiting for it to come on. That was the first tender moment. So the second time, I, I got a little closer. I was outside the door. Standing outside the door. They, they rushed me out because there were complications. And I was saying, oh, dear God, please. <laughs> Let me hear him cry. I wasn't, I wasn't wanting him to cry so, so he could be born. I wanted him to cry as evidence he had been born alive. That's what this passage is teaching. Overcomers have a genuine saving faith that comes from regeneration. See, see, you can, you can step out and say you believe. Well, I believe. I, th- I think I'll believe. I've decided I'm going to believe. And not have had a genuine saving experience. Only those who've been born again, born from above, Jesus said, have true saving faith. Spurgeon said this, faith in the living God and his son Jesus Christ is always the result of the new birth and can never exist except in the regenerate, in other words, in those who have been born again. Calvin says, we don't quabble over this because, because these, are, these are near simultaneous events. For, to the naked eye, we may not, we may not see, perceive. And what, what we do is we're looking for the evidence of the new birth. And the evidence of the new birth is saving faith. The evidence of the new birth is the cry of repentance. I, I, remember, I remember. Then on the third birth, they let me stay in. And I don't know if we just weren't ready for it. Because we had two boys. And I'm sure the sonogram had told us, but I hadn't really sunk in. And, and when, when Joy was delivered, they said, you have a little girl. Well, I just came apart. A little girl. But I was there. She cried. Life. She was immediately dependent upon her mother. And I said, well, this, is, this has been great, folks. I'll take her. Karen, I'll see you when you get home. That would have been disastrous for that child. She was totally dependent upon her mother. That's faith. And I saw it. I saw it. The new birth. In the analogy of birth. That's what Jesus was teaching Nicodemus in in John 3, by the way. So overcomers have a genuine saving faith that comes from regeneration. Are you an overcomer? Is that where your faith came from? Was a, was a spiritual experience so radical it would be likened to birth? Secondly, overcomers have a love for God and a love for others. It's in our, it's in our purpose statement. Who are we? We're Bethel. What are we to be about? Well, we're to follow Christ. Not, not just sit, sit back passively and announce ourselves as Christians. I don't know about you, but I've bumped into people, and this is not unique here, wherever I've pastors, I've bumped into people who thought they were Christians just because they were born in America. Josh was talking about this for, about Somalia a while ago. In Somalia... You don't get to think about what you are. And so if you're born in Somalia, you're a Muslim. This is one of the challenges our missionaries have all across the world. They say, well, of course you're a Christian. You were born in America. That's not how it works. So follow Christ, we say. Love God, the great commandment. Love others, the second like unto it. That's what John says here. The last part of verse 1. And everyone... 
who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. Calvin said, since God regenerates us by faith, he must necessarily be loved by us as a father, and this love embraces all his children. We love the brethren. We show up. Well, the brethren are getting together. Great, I can't wait. Oh, no big deal. I'll, I'll see him in heaven. I'm not, I'm not that concerned. I'll, I'll spend a lot of time with him in heaven. No big deal. No. You love the brethren. You want to be around the brethren. Well, the brethren are worshiping. I want to be there. I want to, I want to tune up with them and get ready for heaven. They're studying. Oh, I love, to, I love to, to study the word on my own. But, boy, I'm getting to study the word together with the brethren. That's great. Getting to pray with the brethren. That's wonderful. It's so what's one of the marks of Acts, Acts 2 church. They all continued steadfastly. It wasn't because they didn't have anything else to do. Most of these people were slaves. They, they had plenty to do. Getting a way to do life with the church was not easy for them. It wasn't, wasn't convenient. Everyone who is loving the Father is loving whoever has been born of him. It's one of the marks. One of the, one of the evidences that you, that you love God is that you love caring for, serving with, And worshiping together with others who have been born of God. You show me a person who doesn't care to be around people who've been born of God, I'll show you a person who has never been born of God. This is one of the things you get concerned about when a person who's been been vitally involved, and you've known people like this. We're, we're, We're dealing with a person today at the end of our service who was vitally involved in this ministry. And then when challenged about a lifestyle that is, is a flagrant violation of the Scripture, fine, I'm gone. Wow. No. If you've been born of God, you love others who have been born of God. You really can't see yourself existing apart from them. Third, overcomers love God and delight in keeping his commandments. Now, this idea of keeping commandments doesn't mean we perfectly keep the Ten Commandments. That's not what he's talking about here. What he's talking about is that we, we delight in them. Jesus, Jesus, I delight after the law of God, he said. Paul said this in Romans 7 when he, when he laid it all on the table and was honest, just judgment day honest. He said, you know, the things that I should be doing, I find myself not doing. The things that I shouldn't do, I find myself doing. Help me, please. He wasn't, he didn't say, well, but you go, no one's perfect. No, help me. Who will deliver me from this carcass strapped to my back? It stinks of death. It's my remaining sin. Paul didn't make excuses for that. He was confessing that. And he was crying out for help in that. But he said this, nevertheless, I delight after the law of God in my inmost being. The Ten Commandments are a rule of life for the believer. Before we're saved, they're they're an instrument of judgment. We stand condemned before the law of God. But when we're saved, they become a a light into our path, (laughs) a lamp into our feet. Because they show us the will and the way of God. They show us. God says, walk this way. What way? I've given it to you. Oh, thank you, Lord. Lord, how can I, how can I live in a way that pleases you, have no other gods before me? Okay, help me, God, to slay the, the, little, the little G gods in my life. God, how can I worship you? Were you to worship me like I, like I am? You're not to imagine me, uh, come up with, with idols and images and uh, and make no likeness of anything in heaven above or in the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You will not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Oh, Lord, help me. Let me worship you in spirit and in truth like, like you say, like you want, like you dictate. Lord, how can I, how can I honor you? How can I bless you and bless, bless others? Don't take my name in vain. Don't use it as a, as a part of a curse 
cursing experience and don't use it to, to bully people around. Well, God told me that you're supposed no, no, don't take it in vain. When you speak it, speak it. Reflecting my preciousness. God, how can I, how can I, how can I honor you, live for you? God says, recognize that I'm the one that's the author of time, that I've made the seven days, not you. And six of them I've given you to labor and do all your work, but one day a week I've given to you and, and rest and reflect upon me with others. That's how. Honor me on the Lord's day. Well, God, how, how do I live so that my relationships reflect your glory? Well, you honor your father and your mother. You show that you recognize that I am your ultimate father. And you show that by honoring the parents I've given you, the authorities. It tends to a long life when you do that. God, how do, I, how do I live on this earth in a way that shows that you are more valuable to me than anything else? He says, then you show that you value life. Don't kill. Don't murder. Stand up for the unborn who are being slaughtered. God, how do I, how do I show that your relationship is precious? Make the marriage relationship precious. Exclusive. Monogamous. Don't carry on like, a, like an immoral person in this world and show that, that my, my being deserves your faithfulness. Don't steal. Don't steal. Recognize that I'm the author of everything. I own everything. I'm the one that disperses it out. Don't steal. Don't lie. I am the truth. I speak truth and only truth to you. The only place you find truth is in God. Jesus said he is the way, the truth, not a truth, the truth. God says speak truth. Tell the truth. Honor truth. Put a value on truth. We're in, we're in an election season. There are more lies per moment being pumped out and paid for than perhaps at any other time in the year. Truth. Well, God, how do, I, how do I live and find my satisfaction in you? Don't covet. Don't be discontent. Don't act like I've dealt you a short deck and find your contentment in me. This is one of the questions I asked. I was, in talking with this individual, I said, what can you, how can you do this knowing what you know about the Scripture? Don't I deserve to be happy? Well, the question following that is, why doesn't Jesus make you happy? Brothers and sisters, check, ask yourself, in order for me to have happiness in this life, I must have, and then fill in the blank there. And if the blank's not filled with Jesus, something's wrong. In fact, if something's, something's wrong so that the door is being opened to other things. Jesus is all the world to me. I want no better friend. I trust him now. I'll trust him when life's fading days shall end. Oh. You see, it's not, it's not about perfectly keeping the Ten Commandments. It's about treasuring them, valuing them. Overcomers have a love for God. John's filled with this. The guy who says, well, I love God but despises his brother is a liar. John doesn't mince any words. If you had not read 1 John in a while, we're, we're going to be looking uh, at 1 John in the coming weeks on Sunday night. But I mean, he takes no prisoners. So you say you love God, but you go on sinning habitually? You're a liar. This is, by this we know that we love the children of God. When we love God and obey His commandments. That's, that's beautiful. When you and I strive to, to honor the Ten Commandments in our lives, we're loving others. Other people's property, they'll feel safe around us with their property. They'll feel safe around us with their relationships. They'll, they'll feel like they can hear us and, and believe what we're having to say.
And then he says in verse 3, for this is, this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. That's, that's interesting. I, th- I know people say, oh, man, you, don't weight me down with that, man. Really? Why are the Ten Commandments of God a weight to you? When John says in 1 John, one of the last books in the New Testament, the commandments of God are not a burden. Now don't, don't pretend. Don't let some of these people who like to play magic with the Bible pretend that that's another group of commandments. The commandments of God are the commandments he gave And if you find yourself burdened by them, I'm not suggesting that they're just easy as pie, but I'm suggesting that when you feel the weight of them, you're pretending that is the love of God for you. It'd be like a person driving in Colorado on those winding mountainous roads and saying, man, these rails, these rails are hedging me in, man. I want some freedom. Freedom? (laughs) To go over the edge? Oh, he gives us because he loves us. One, one old writer said, the highest service that any man can render to humanity is to love God and keep his commandments. Be the best employer you can be if you do that. The best employee you can be. The best neighbor you can be. The best friend you can be. The best stranger you can be. His commandments are not a burden except to those who are under them as an instrument of judgment to condemn them to hell. But those who've been born again and are believing that Jesus is the Christ find them a delight to know. I've shared this with you before, but you know, if you came to me and said, you know, Brother Bill, I think you, you seem to know so-and-so pretty well. I, I want to really bless them. What, what do you think would do that? Or better still, better analogy. I want, I want to bless your wife, Karen. You know her pretty well. Yeah, I know her pretty well. But you just, just do whatever you think to make her happy. Well, now you may have had a sincere desire, but I've now, I've now condemned you to frustration. But just go love God. You know, just, just love God like you want to, just whatever, whatever, whatever you think. God hadn't left us like that. God's given us a directive, a rule of life. One writer said, loving God means obeying his commands. Jesus said in in John 14, 21, he who has my commandments, and by the way, Jesus' commandments are not from God's. He who has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. See, overcomers also. Overcoming is the inevitable outcome of regeneration. This is the thing. It's not like people who have been born again that a few of those folks overcome, no. Verse 4, for everyone who has been born of God knows everyone who has been born again is overcoming the world. That doesn't mean perfectly. Folks, I had a difficult week. I struggled in some areas this week. And had I not remembered the truth, I I would have felt defeated. I'll be honest with you. You can't do what we're going to do in a few minutes and leave that as a pastor and not feel a certain failure in your own life as a pastor and as a parent. You can't do it. But the truth of the matter is that everyone who's been born again is overcoming the world. The world may not want you to know that. The world may carry on and try to convince you that's not so. And then this is the victory that has overcome the world. See, overcoming is the inevitable outcome. If you've been born again here today, it doesn't mean you won't ever lose your way. But it means when you do, you'll lose your way. And you're confronted in whatever, by whatever means God chooses. The conscience, bringing to, to remembrance the scripture that you know, putting someone in your life who loves you like like God put Nathan in David's life and Nathan said, David, David, I'm talking about you. You're the one. I thank God when I read that passage that David didn't go, that's none of your business, Nathan. I deserve to be happy. Being a king's tough, you know? No. When, When Nathan, under God, 
pointed to David's sin. David broke. Yes, he had committed adultery. Yes, the woman with whom he committed adultery conceived. And yes, he had the woman's husband murdered to cover it up. Horrible, heinous. Seventh commandment, boom! Eighth commandment, boom! And then brokenness and repentance. That's the beauty. That's an overcomer. When it can be brought back by the word of reproof, rebuke, correction. See, the jury's still out on this individual we're going to take action on because we don't know what means God may use to recover her. But if we love her, we will keep God's commandments in this matter. Finally, overcoming is fueled by genuine saving faith. <clears throat> the last part of verse 4, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. Who is he, who is it that overcomes the world except the one who is believing that Jesus is the Son of God? We've come back full circle in this passage, you see. Our faith. Not notional faith, not the idea, well, I, I, I believe in God and all that stuff. No, notional faith. Well, I believe that Jesus was a good man. I, I, notional faith. Not even saying faith. Well, but I, I said that. I mean, I, I prayed the prayer. I walked the aisle. I signed the card. I joined the church. Not notional faith, not saying faith. Not demon faith. Demons believe and they're not saved. But saving faith that comes from being born again. It's the fruit. And so it's... Born again is the fruit, is, is, the fu is, is the source. Saving faith is the fuel. Continues to feed it. This is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who is believing? Jesus is the Son of God. See, it's not complicated, folks. It's simple. If you've been born again, and the evidence of that is a, a, heart of, a, a life of repenting for sin, a life of believing in Christ, living for Christ, doing the hard things. Do you believe? Do you believe today? Sometimes you're called upon to do the hard things. Removing somebody from membership according to God's plan and purpose in the hope of that being a remedy for that person coming to repent and return to the Lord and return to his church takes saving faith. Because the devil will lie to us and tell us, quote, it won't work. It seems harsh. It's judgmental. Who are we to judge? Doesn't the Bible say judge not? We've gone through all this stuff, folks. We've studied it. And here's where we are. If we're going to be overcomers, which accomplishes a couple of things here. One will keep us from ever having to be the subject of church discipline. And two, will strengthen us, enable us to, for the glory of God and the good of the individual, under consideration. Give us faith to act, trusting God. Trusting God. All other means the scripture tells us to employ have been employed and all other means have failed to this point. The one last means is what Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 5, to hand this one over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the person's soul might be saved in the day of Jesus Christ. And that's where we find ourselves as overcomers. Jesus says, John 16, 33, I've said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. Brother and sister, that's the only place I find peace today. In him. In the world you'll have tribulation. People read that and think about a set of books. That, no, the word is squeezed. In this world you will be squeezed. 
If you haven't been, you will be. Many of you I'm looking at, I know have been. But he goes on and says, but be of good cheer. Take heart. Don't, don't get disheartened. Don't get discouraged. Don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. Don't think all is lost. Take heart. I have overcome the world. The chief overcomer who calls us to be overcomers by his grace through faith in him, faith that was gifted to us in the new birth, says, don't lose heart. The squeeze will not do us in. By God's grace, it purifies us. A time like this should purify every one of us. The devil's lying to some of you right now saying, who are you? I mean, you're, you're no, look at you. What, what if everybody knew about you? That's not the point. The point is not a, a group of perfect people gathering to take action on an imperfect person. The, the point is a group of imperfect people who love God and love that person taking action for the soul of that person. Because it doesn't matter if they were a church member, if they're living like the world. Plenty of Baptists will be in hell with their church membership cards burned up. It's only those who persevere to the end. Only those who demonstrate living faith, saving faith, overcoming faith by repenting, forgiving, believing. So, at this time, I'll entertain a motion where we enter into a brief congregational meeting for the purpose of taking redemptive